today we're going to talk about loot boxes. So what are loot boxes? Let me just check whether we are live on on LinkedIn. Yes, we are. Okay, let's get started. So on the back of a Star Wars Battlefront 2 debacle in 2017, being Star, Star Wars Battlefront 2 being a, a new game which had been launched in 2017, Many European regulators, including the uh, UK and French ones, have started to take an increasingly scrutinizing and judging stance on loot boxes offered for purchase to children and young persons who play video games. Why are loot boxes potentially dangerous? And what are the UK and French regulators and other governments in the world doing to protect vulnerable players from these random reward mechanisms. So let's start first by defining the concept, so to speak, of loot boxes. Well, they are a relatively recent phenomenon uh, entering discourse around 2006 when the game, uh, the video game industry was also in full explosion. There is evidence that the use of the term loot box developed from the more general phenomenon of random reward mechanisms, RRMs, random reward mechanisms that have been used in games, in board games even, since the early 1990s. So RRMs operate similarly to other forms of chance and game of chance, such as collectible cards. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I was collecting all these panini cards. Yeah, maybe you did as well. And then also the Kinder Eggs. So you open the egg, I mean, you, you go to your local bakery. I was the, the time back in the uh, 80s um, in France. And you go to your local bakery, you buy a Kinder Egg, you eat the um, external, you know, which is in chocolate. And inside there is a random reward mechanism. So you don't know what you're going to get, but you know you're going to get a little game, a little, you know, a gimmick thing. And so it can be traced back to the to 19th century secret cards, actually, these RRMs, these random reward mechanisms. So RRMs are based on the principle of desirable free products contained within another product, Kinder Egg, which contains the box with a little uh, loot which is sold and the nature of the game relies on blind purchases of random items. Okay, so using collectible cards as an example, buyers continue to pay for cards in the hope of finding the particular cards they want. So for example, coming back to the Panini cards that I used to buy in the eighties, well, we wanted to buy those cards because then we would have access, we would create a team of, um, of football players, if I remember well, me and my brother, and so we we were keep, kept on buying those panini cards because we wanted to have um, a, a collectible card for this particular player, which I think at the time was Star Wars Platini, really for the French team, et cetera, et cetera. So the market for these goods operates with inf information asymmetry. Sellers control the availability, uh, do not publish probabilistic probability statistics and capitalize on buyers' desires. So of course, kids and young people are the most uh, susceptible to fall for uh, random reward mechanisms, RRMs, obviously. While these antecedents of loot boxes are established and accept randomness as an element of play in physical and virtual games of chance, research indicates that Video games have been putting random items in treasure chests for decades. Therefore, the randomness of reward is the key distinguishing feature of loot boxes around which all definitions agree. In terms of distinguishing and classifying those loot boxes, the division centers on the mechanism of reward. 
So key distinguishing factors in definitions of uh, these loot boxes are the type of loot boxes. Are they cosmetic, i.e. it's going to be a customization of an avatar or a player's character? So the looks of a player's character in the game? Or are they um, integral slash game improvement loot boxes? So for example, tools, weapons, maps, superpowers. The, these are the distinction uh, uh, of loot boxes relating to the type of loot boxes. Then you've got the currencies used. Are they going to be virtual currencies, only viable through the game, the video game, or viable through Bitcoin? Or are they real world money? So um, you have to bear in mind that the cost of loot boxes vary from a few euros, like one to two euros or dollars or whatever, to up to 100 euros uh, or more even sometimes. So this is a pretty remunerative business for video game publishers. Then a, a second a distinguishing factor of loot boxes is ubiquity. Is it going to be a popular uh, a loot box or is it going to be a niche loot box for certain kind of players, you know, gone up to certain levels? Then you also have access uh, as a distinguishing factor. Is the reward for playing the game well? Is it a reward for playing the game well? Or is it a reward for sustained game playing? Um, sometimes the cost of loot boxes range, ranges from some gameplay, such as finishing a level in the game, for example. But sometimes it can, it can also require from the, the player heavy se several hours um, and often repetitive gameplay, which is called grinding. So what type of access um, criteria exists for this particular loot box? And then the exclusiveness is, is another uh, criteria to define loot boxes. The player has no other way of acquiring items other than spending money on the loot boxes. So RRMs have been conceptualized in four types, depending on the resources, players, tender versus the potential reward. So resources, reward. They, these may be either isolated, so I uh, RRMs, or E embedded RRMs in the real world economy. So the criteria are isolated or embedded. And um, it can be non-isolated or isolated, and then it can be embedded or non-embedded. So there are four options every time. This leads to four types of loot boxes, as I just mentioned. So non-purchasable, so II would be non-purchasable and non-sellable RRMs um, in single player games, such as the first iteration of the Diablo game, which was that Diablo 1. In this game, the loot boxes were non-purchasable and non-sellable. Okay, so then you've got IE, which is non-purchasable but sellable, so these loot boxes can be traded, okay? So you don't buy them, but you can sell them. And so that was in the third iteration of Diablo, this is what loot boxes were, okay? And then you've got purchasable, but not sellable. And um, in this instance, uh, that can be bought those loot boxes, as I said, through real, mon real world money or virtual money, but they cannot be traded. And this is the kind of loot boxes that you have in the game called Overwatch. And then you've got purchasable and tradable loot boxes, so EE uh, loot boxes, which are can be bought and traded in multiple player games. And this type of loot boxes is uh, available in Team Fortress 2, also the game called Counter-Strike Global Offensive, also called CS go and also player unknowns battlegrounds so these these the, the fourth i've just mentioned this is the most tricky type of loot boxes for regulators as we go as we're going to discuss so while some researchers consider that only ee type loot boxes so the fourth one i've just mentioned can be considered gambling others like uh, um, the researcher leon xio has xiao xiao which who is a, a fellow PhD researcher at Denmark University, have argued against that position, pointing towards the future galaxy.com case. So in this case, from 2000, uh, uh, um, 
before 2017, sorry, a third party website meant that game currencies and rewards that were isolated by design could in fact be traded on this particular website. So making them effectively embedded in this case. So loot boxes are a form of microtransactions where they are available as an in-game purchase. However, loot boxes are only one part of the in-game purchase market, of course. They are other type of microtransactions. But the basically particularity of loot boxes is and the unique element is that the, the change mechanism. For other forms of in-game purchases, players will know what item they will receive in advance of purchase. Unlike in loot boxes, there is this element of chance. So it has to be mentioned that um, loot boxes equal big money uh, for game publishers and um, game uh, studios. In 2021, there were 2.96 billion gamers globally. I repeat this figure, striking figure, 2.96 billion gamers globally, generating 2020 revenues of 100 89.3 billion US dollars, okay, in 2020. From the top five companies, which are Chinese company Tencent, Japanese company Sony, and American companies, Microsoft, Apple, and Activision Blizzards. So those five top players generated around $190 billion in 2020, okay? So and they account for 43% of global game revenues, these five, you know, uh, competitors. So we're looking here at the kind of oligopoly sort of situation here, just to mention, you know, as far as competition is concerned. So video games is one of the fastest growing entertainment sectors with, I mean, way bigger in terms of revenues, for example, that the um, film industry or, you know, the, um, book publishing industry. I mean, the numbers are massive. You know, the margins they make on these video games are just really, really big for publishers and um, and um, and studios. We, so the predicted there's a there are predictions predictions sorry of a compound annual growth rate of around ten percent over twenty twenty two to two thousand thirty. So the future is bright. For the video games industry. In this context, loot boxes and microtransactions are highly lucrative. Revenues generated from loot boxes used in video games will exceed $20 billion in 2025, up from an estimated $15 billion in 2020. Big money. No wonder large studios such as Activision Blizzard and Electronic Arts have patented the loot box mechanisms to combat imitation. So in the latest thought leadership article that we published yesterday on our website, crefovi.com and crefovi.fr, you can actually find the written version of his content, which I'm discussing about today. And in there, you will be able to click on our various external links that we add. And for example, to see this um, um, website, which we link to where you can actually find the patent information about the electronic arts patent on loot boxes. Okay, so this is accessible for Engli the English version on crefovi.com slash publication and for the French version on crefovi.fr slash publication. Okay, and you can subscribe to our, um, to our uh, basically weekly um, uh, subscription plan uh, on, on our website, in our store. Uh, so crefovi.com slash store for the English version of the content or crefovi.fr slash magasin for the French version. Now let's move on. So as explained in our article, but which is also viewable on our database of, of um, um, restricted content, on Microsoft acquisition of Activ Activision Blizzard, gamers access video games freeways. 
So they can purchase the game. This is the first option. They can purchase the game for a set price. That is a premium purchase price model, which is the most traditional business model. And it is still used for traditional games like Grand Theft Auto V and Assassin's Creed, for example. Very traditional and well-established franchises by now. The second, second access uh, 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 option is the subscription for a monthly, sometimes yearly basis for access to a game. So this is the model used by Blizzard Entertainment's World of Warcraft, which is perhaps the most successful game that utilizes this subscription model. Or the third way to access video games is downloading games which are free to play but may have to execute micro microtransactions we just mentioned in particular with the loot boxes in order to obtain discrete pieces of content for example for example a player may spend a dollar on a new sword for a character or on a vanity item such as changing the color of a character's hair like in the most popular pc game in the world riot games leads of legend which sells a variety of items that can customize the base game, which itself is given away for free. So this is the third and last scenario, i.e. the premium model of distribution built around these microtransactions as a revenue stream that loot boxes thrive. The game is downloaded from digital platforms such as the App Store, the Google Play or Steam. We most players spending no money at all to play the game. Loot boxes are inserted into free, these freemium games as a mechanism for in-app purchases. Even if play, players do not wish to access loot boxes, they cannot avoid exposure to these features of the game. They will const constantly be reminded of the opportunity to avail themselves of the random rewards contained in loot boxes. So it's so super tempting. So um, all, since there is this element of chance that we mentioned before with you know probability to get something, but um, um, we don't know exactly what probability is, is, is to get that, are loot boxes including the definition of gambling under the UK Gambling Act 2015 and French law uh, dated 12th of May 2010, which regulates French gambling? No. Loot boxes are not legally considered gambling in the United Kingdom and France. Concerns have been raised about whether the purchase of loot boxes is like a game of chance and therefore a form of gambling. Particular concerns have been raised about loot boxes within video games targeted at children or young people. In 2016, the UK Gambling Commission identified loot boxes as a potential risk to children as part of a wide review of gaming and gambling. The Gambling Commission subsequently stated that whether it has powers to intervene in the loot box market is based on a judgment of whether a particular activity is considered a game of chance played for money or money's worth under relevant provisions of the UK Gambling Act 2005. The commission said that, and I quote here, where in-game items obtained via loot boxes are confined for use within the game and cannot be cashed out, it is unlikely to be caught as a licensable gambling activity. In those cases, our legal powers would not allow us to step in. The same conclusion was reached by the French Autorité de Régulation des Jeux en Ligne, ARGEL, which has since been renamed as ING, Autorité Nationale des Jeux. In its 2017-2018 activity report, ARGEL concluded that loot boxes except the embedded, embedded type loot boxes, such as in the games we mentioned before, Player Unknown, Battleground, Team Fortress, and Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which have been investigated already and largely resolved by Argel and other regulators uh, 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 and the game industry together. So ex 
in this 2017 2018 activity report, Argel, the French regulator for gambling in France, concluding that loot boxes were outside the scope of French law dated 12th of May 2010, relating to the opening of competition and regulation in the sector of online money and chance games. So for French and UK gambling regulators, the games that are most commonly mentioned in the debate of loot boxes of the watch Star Wars Battlefront 2 and FIFA Ultimate Team belong to the E embedded slash um, included type. So purchasable, but not sellable RRMs, uh, re 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 random reward mechanisms. And thus they do not meet the legal definition of gambling those loot boxes in these games. Not every European company, company um, country, apologies, not every European country has taken this route though, with Belgium and the Netherlands ruling that the sale of loot boxes in certain circumstances is a form of gambling and of a national gambling legislation. Slovakia, another EU member state, European Union member state, also considers loot boxes to be gambling under its national law legal definition, but has yet to take regulatory action on them. And more recently, in 2022, Spain has committed to introduce new legislation to restrict the sale of loot boxes. Interestingly, on a more global level in Europe, the European Union, the European Union institutions, and in particular the European Commission, declined to take any significant targeted action to address the topic of loot boxes because the EU has little competence in the area of gambling, as this competence mainly lies with EU member states. As a result, in France, the United Kingdom, but also Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and the other EU member states, except Belgium, the Netherlands, Slovakia, and Spain, Loot boxes are regulated by general, general national legislation on contracts and consumer protection statutory rules. There is no, in most European countries at, at this type, point in time, there is no focused and dedicated regulation targeting loot boxes. So why are loot boxes an issue as it stands? Well, as I mentioned in my introduction, a scandal erupted in November 2017 when the game studio EA suspended microtransactions in Star Wars Battlefront 2 following a furor over loot boxes hours before the game's launch. While other game developers and publishers had been embroiled in the controversy of the loot boxes for a while, EA took the brunt due to the imbalance potentially caused by randomized loot in this competitive multiplayer shooter game. This is when more and more national gambling authorities and governments started to take the issues potentially caused by loot boxes really seriously and launched investigations in particular Belgium, as I mentioned, and also the Netherlands in 2017, but also the UK. Uh, moreover, a study published in 2020 by Wiley surveyed the 100 top grossing games on the Google Play Store and the App Store from Apple it found that 58% of the Google games and 59% of the iPhone games contained loot boxes. Okay, they are free to download those games. They are for the freemium model. So how do they get paid? Well, by putting all these loot boxes. And who plays those games on the iPhones and um, Google? Most kids and young people. Of those that contain loot boxes, 93% of the Google games and 95% of the iPhone games were available to children age 12 and over. So loot boxes are not extremely not uh, an extremely common occurrence in freemium games. Also, loot boxes are becoming even more appealing to players because premium fashion brands and luxury labels such as Gucci, Burberry, and Nike are partnering partnering up 
with video games publishers to provide even more attractive and hype cosmetic and avatar custom customization options to players. So this makes it even more difficult to resist for a player and for fashion conscious youth, um, these opportunities to purchase loot boxes containing fashion designers items on their favorite games. In September 2019, the UK House of Commons Digital Cultural, Culture, Media and Sports Committee, so it is abbreviated to DCMS, Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee, published its report entitled Immersive and Addictive Technologies. The report detailed financial harms associated with online gam gaming including gambling-like behaviors, which can affect some users, especially those in vulnerable age groups like children and young people. DCMS heard evidence that there were, a quote here, structural and psychological similarities between loot boxes and gambling. The report recommended that loot boxes that contain the element of chance should not be sold to children playing games and instead, in-game credits should be earned through rewards, one through playing the games. So, what are the UK and French regulators or, and governments doing to limit the damage caused by loot boxes, which seem to have a psychological and financial effect, which is similar to gambling? So, this basically prompted the UK government to launch a call for evidence in September 2020 and the wider review of the Gambling Act 2005 in December 2020. The consultation outcome of a call for evidence was released in July 2022, probably uh, delayed by the um, uh, management of a COVID-19 pandemic. I should think it was pretty long uh, you know, delay between the, the date of the launch in September 2020 and the outcome of this consultation in July 2022. The main message conveyed by the UK government to the games industry as a, as a consultation I've come to this call for evidence was that the game industry must self-regulate and take immediate action on loot boxes or risk future legislation. In a typical political Tories move, the conclusion of a consultation was that improved industry-led protections were the best approach over regulation under an amended version of the UK Gambling Act 2005, which would classify loot boxes as gambling, and, other, um, and also am and amendments of other statutory consumer protections. So under these improved um, industry-led protections, industry trade body UKIE, which is the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the trade body for the video game industry in the UK, and its members, video games publishers, should go further and more should be done uh, across game platforms and publishers to mitigate the risk of harm from loot boxes, while purchase of loot boxes should be unavailable to all children and young people unless and until they are enabled by a parent or guardian. So the view of the DCMS set out in its July 2022 conclusion to the call for evidence is that it would be premature to pursue legislation with regards to loot boxes without first pursuing enhanced industry-led protections. It seems like a sensible approach. Tory or not Tory, it is a sensible approach, I should think. Um, but not too long should be, should be, um, uh, uh, should, 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 basically the period during which this uh, approach to self-regulation should not be too long before a, another assessment as to whether legislative change needs to be imposed. So. What the government did as well, and the DCMS did as well for the, uh, is, is that it convened a technical working group to pursue these enhanced industry-led measures to mitigate the risk of harms from loot boxes in video games. And this technical working group includes representative of games, 
companies and different platforms and also government departments and regulatory bodies. So among the members of this technical working group that I've just mentioned is the above mentioned PhD fellow, Lian Xiao, probably Chinese guy, uh, who, who basically the subject of his research is loot boxes and video game law. In a seminal piece, Lian Xiao criticizes Belgium's loot box ban as ineffective because even though Belgium technically banned loot boxes using its gambling law in 2018, 82% of the highest grossing iPhone games on the Belgium App Store continue to monetize using loot boxes in 2022. So what's the point of you know, banning loot boxes in law if then you can't enforce the ban in reality? It just looks like you basically completely powerless as a, as a Belgium regulator, which is the case really. So it, the Belgian regulator has not actively enforced the law due to a lack of resources and enforcement power. Therefore, any self-regulatory framework, sh framework should be supported by effective enforcement mechanisms with an independent body set up to review compliance actions by game publishers and hand down penalties such as fines and financial penalties in case of non-compliance. Xiao, in his uh, article, recommends that funding of this for this enforcement task could be obtained from a mandatory financial levy on the gaming industry. Liam Zhao also suggests that the UK loot box self-regulation approach involves the creation of a code of conduct within the meaning of regulation 2.1 of consumer protection from unfair trading regulations 2008. This would imply that any failure to comply with verifiable self-regulatory commitments explicit set out in this code of conduct by a signatory company may be subject to legal proceedings. This combination of flexibility for the code of conduct, industry commitment for self-regulation and also enforcement powers through potential legal proceedings if you don't comply with the code, thanks to the UK statutory regulations, would be ideal, according to Liang Zhao. Another tool of enhance, to enhance self-regulation would be to require mandatory loot box probability disclosures, such as, such as the ones required in China. Indeed, China has required video games platforms to disclose the probabilities of obtaining randomized items from loot boxes since 2017. Only 64% of games containing loot boxes disclose probabilities on the UK App Store, compared to 95.6% on the Chinese store. Yeah, they don't uh, stray in China. If you don't uh, follow the rule, you're out in China. So while Apple has some App Store review guidelines, also in the UK App Store, which set out that loot box probability disclosures must be made, it has not actively enforced the self-regulatory probability disclosure requirements, as uh, Zao noted. This should change, and failing to disclose probabilities should cause the games to be removed from the store, from the platform. Also, these probability disclosures should be sufficiently prominent and easily accessible to players, and the UK self-regulation measures should encompass industry-wide minimal standards that all companies must meet in this respect. So Dow is like, okay, let's do self-regulation, but you know, the Chinese way, yeah? Like pushy, like tough. I'm, I'm, I wonder, to be honest, this is like, a, I wonder whether the UK regulators are going to take such a pushy approach. It, it, it remains to be seen. But, you know, at the end of the day, if it really affects kids and, uh, uh, um, and young, young persons playing games in the UK, I think, frankly, they don't have an option. They really have to put the pressure on the um, video games uh, publishers. Another self-regulatory measure, according to Xiao, that has been uniformly applied is PEGI. Um, in, and I quote here, includes paid random items label. Okay, so what is PGI? It's the European Video Game Content Rating System Provider, and it provides labels, okay? And one of these labels that you can see when you buy the game is includes paid random items. 
meaning in plain English, include loot boxes. So um, this PGI label would attach to any games containing loot boxes to provide additional information to players and parents. But PGI label seems ineffective because it does not inform players and parents as to exactly how the loot box me mechanic can be identified so as to allow players and parents to avoid engaging with it once they bought the, the, purchased the game. Therefore, an improvement would be to specifically describe the loot box mechanic in the game and provide a choice in the options menu to turn the ability to purchase loot boxes on or off, potentially even with the default option set to off, according to Leon Zhao. And it, it seems like a very good suggestion, uh, I, I think. So while the UK is attempting to find the best way to force the video games industry to self-regulated on loot boxes and microtransactions, in particular by getting some support and um, and insights from um, basically experts like Liang Zhao. And France has completely lost the plot on the subject entirely. They are doing Argel uh, and, and French regulators are doing nothing about loot boxes at all, as far as I could see. Australia, in the meantime, has filed a loot box bill on the 28th of November, 2022, so a few days ago, with its proposed legislation requiring games with loot boxes to be rated R 18 plus and carrying warnings for parents in order to keep children from purchasing and playing games with loot boxes. So Australia, I mean, um, except from the, during the pandemic uh, COVID-19, where I understand the management of this uh, pandemic by the government was pretty heavy handed, but Australia is, uh, is, is, is more of a, you know, um, as far as I understand, a um, less regulation is better kind of country, you know, pretty capitalistic and, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon way. So, uh, you know, a, a less fair approach. But it's interesting to see in this instance that he really took such a strong stance against loot boxes. And it probably is a sign that quite a lot of kids and young people are suffering or making their families suffer because of um, this loot box thing. And, um, and it's probably having some pretty detrimental psychological effect and financial effects on these kids and, family, and their families. So this is the approach that Australia is taking. And for example, um, so to conclude, this is a stark warning to video game companies that they must change their ways quickly in order to work with governments, and in particular the UK government, to implement effective and strictly enforced self-regulating measures to avoid any further children's and young person's psychological and financial exploitation via loot boxes. I am hopeful that game publishers have got the message since many large studios such as Activision Blizzard, Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, French company Ubisoft and First Touch Games, as well as trade association representing the UK's game industry, Tiger, submitted evidence to the above mentioned 2020 call for evidence. So they were engaged with large um, video publishers and companies in the process of working with the UK government to provide evidence and, um, and lobby, to be honest. So, Let's watch the space and see whether video game companies are up to the challenge of self-regulation and can also come with decisive and effective self-regulatory measures which will be enforced industry-wide in the UK and beyond. If not, I think more and more governments are going to go for legislation after this sort of wait and see period where, where they assess the, uh, the, the self-regulation. So if you are a game publisher, if you are a um, game editor uh, and, uh, and uh, company, don't hesitate to come to us so that we can at Krefovi, our love film Krefovi, in order to discuss how to get engaged in this process of self-regulation for your, um, the, the TCMS, the UK government, and, um, and also uh, uh, trade bodies like Tiger and UKIE. 
um, and um, uh, we can we can support you in uh, in 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 implementing the steps to um, make sure that loot boxes are available within the right remit. This is all for me for me from for now. Thank you very much for being here and listening to our content, curated content. You can subscribe to our uh, various channels on Spotify, uh, uh, our uh, podcast, Lawfully Creative on Spotify, on Deezer, and frankly on almost every uh, podcast aggregating platforms, and also on YouTube. We are also on YouTube, and also you can listen to our content on our website, preferably.com and preferably.fr. Bye for now. Thank you and see you next time. Bye.